Day 826 of the Ukrainian War Map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian War Juzzy Hill, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. So, starting off, we'll take a look at those Russian losses, as currently, Russia sits on more than 506,000 military personnel losses, representing an additional 1,160 in the past day. Then, as for hardware losses, 10 tanks, 22 APVs, and 35 artillery. Then we'll head straight to the map and start out in Crimea, as explosions were reported in Kirsch right by the Crimean Bridge, as local Russian telegram channels reported multiple explosions, seemingly with the attack designed for a Russian naval base in the area. The reported missile attack occurred at night, so at 1am, at about 240 kilometers away from the front lines. Now, reports indicate that the target was near the bridge and not the bridge itself, which might be upsetting to some, with reportedly, so far, five boats and two ferries damaged as a result of the night attacks. A Russian source also claimed that the weapons used, of unknown type, in this latest incident had, quote, proved extremely effective against the Russian military target, despite high concentrations of Russian air defense systems in the area. But ultimately, we do wait on more information from some of that daytime satellite imagery just to see exactly what happened. Then we'll head to the north, the northeast of Ukraine, as Sentinel 2 satellite data has shown the intensity of the conflict around the Vovchansk front lines, showing various fires from artillery shelling. Now, some other satellite data imagery also displays quite the heat map directly center of the town, north of the river, which is precisely where the front lines are drawn, with the fighting at its most fierce. In fact, there's been really recent indications of Russian forces losing ground in three distinctly separate locations with the urbanized positions on the town's map, which have reportedly led Russian forces to increasingly be resorting to destroying the town with MLRS, so the multiple launch rocket systems, heavy artillery, and airdropped glide munitions from a distance. And I have to imagine some level of friendly fire occurring as a result of that too. Then we move southeast as there were at least two notable explosions in the Donetsk region, with the first near to... Novo Troitska, and the second one being closer to the outer northwest section of the Donetsk city. But once again for today, little is known about the outcome or the actual targets. Then briefly, a little bit further north, as we'll just touch on the west of Shasivya for a moment. Not a great deal of changes, although in the last week there has been small incremental gains up to the, the canal of the, the, from the Russian forces there. As the Russian forces look to continue to attempt to encapsulate the smaller western exclave part of the town in an urban warfare style environment, which does tend to slow things down a bit. Then, somewhere in the east, Ukrainian soldiers from the 92nd Separate Assault Brigade continue to destroy or damage Russian equipment and personnel in the Kharkiv region, in this case, uh, showing off with this latest set of examples, including two trucks and one T-72 tank. Then also on the map, we saw an AFU FPV attack onto a Russian BM-21 Grad MLRS system. Then, possibly for the seventh day in a row, Another Russian T-90 tank was seen struck by two FPV drones. So the first FPV drone went in and disabled the tank, causing the operators to abandon vehicle. Then the second FPV came in to finish the job off. Now Russia has an estimated 350 of these tanks, the T-90s of any variant, from T-90A through to T-90M, even T-90S, which is the export edition. But all in all, with a bare minimum of 200 confirmed as destroyed at this stage, at least. Then to mix things up a bit, I wanted to show you guys this incredible archival footage from March or April of this year. As what we see here is the Ukrainian operated M1 Abrams tank in action, firing on the Russian held coke plant northwest of Avdivka. It really is something else. Then on the map, but technically still within the eastern Donetsk region, we saw examples of yesterday's repelled Russian attacks 
on the Urazanya front right there. Now, as you might discern, both of these were tanks, one of which ended up being quite crispy. Oh, then speaking of crispy, Ukraine wastes no time in targeting Russian air defense systems within the occupied oblasts, with this latest inclusion being a Russian Book M1 system, which was destroyed 20 kilometers south of Melitopol with an FPV drone. Yep, you heard that right, which amounts to about 100 kilometers or about 60 miles from the front lines, which means it was clearly some special variant of an FPV drone to succeed like that in terms of range and payload. Then headed further to the west, as somewhere in amongst the Delta Riverways of the Dnipro River, a Russian jet ski and operator were spotted, presumably performing some type of reconnaissance mission. But they left themselves wide open to compromise, and right around the point of disembarking, the jet ski was destroyed by some unknown type of Ukrainian fire. Then headed across to some news for today. So the US Army opened the Universal Artillery Projectile Lines facility in Texas, with the new plant producing 155mm artillery shells as part of Washington's push to modernize shell production. This move also aligns with the West's efforts to bolster artillery production to support Ukraine's battlefield needs, especially as Ukraine has transitioned largely to the 155mm NATO standard artillery shells since not long after the start of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, as a result of dwindling Soviet shell stockpiles. Now, in terms of production, currently the US produces about 36,000 shells a month, although that's a slightly older figure. It may have hit around the 40,000 mark, with the new Texas plant to impressively add another 30,000 shells per month when fully operational, alongside the creation of around 350 local jobs when reaching full capacity. Then in some other similar news, Ukraine has been spotted using 125mm shells of Indian production for the first time. So these armor-piercing rounds use a tungsten alloy core sheathed in steel to penetrate enemy armor and are used on platforms including the T-72 tank, but also commonly used in anti-tank systems as well. And while the exact quantity and delivery details of the Indian-made shells are unknown, their presence on the battlefield demonstrates Ukraine's efforts to secure ammunition from various sources to sustain its defense operations. Then headed across to some Russian hardware news, just by contrast, so some military specialists have identified Iran's latest aviation-launched guided munition, the GAM, as found on a crashed Russian-slash-Iranian Mahaja-6 drone in the Kursk region of Russia from just a few days ago. Now, this marks the first time that this type of weapon has been seen during the war providing additional evidence of a new level of military cooperation between Tehran and Moscow. But as for the Gahem 5 guided munition payload as found on the Mahaja drone, well, these air-launched guided munitions have a target of around 12 to 18 kilometers, which is not a long distance for this type of weapon. So in fact, it's probably no wonder that this drone was somehow downed, given that it has to get so close to enemy lines to release such a weapon. Then in some more news, Russia has significantly intensified the recruitment of mercenaries from Africa for the full-scale war against Ukraine, as information from Ukraine's military intelligence reports. So new mercenaries from Rwanda, Burundi, the Congos, and Uganda are being recruited as assault troopers by a specially created unit of the Russian Defense Ministry. So this development continues to suggest that Russia is seeking to bolster its forces with foreign fighters as the war in Ukraine continues. And so the recruitment of mercenaries from African countries raises concerns about the potential exploitation of vulnerable populations for the conflict as we see Russia continue to do everything possible to avoid an unpopular mass mobilization back home. Then headed across to some economy news. So the owner of AliExpress, the Chinese e-commerce giant Alibaba, has taken a decisive step by halting shipments to Russia and refusing to accept payments in rubles. Yesterday, Russian media outlets reported that Alibaba had tightened its conditions for Russian businesses as revealed by Commerçant, a prominent Russian business newspaper. 
And so these policy changes were driven by fears of potential secondary sanctions, which have caused payment issues between Russia and China since December 2023 now. In fact, the impact of sanctions has been far-reaching, with several Chinese banks, including three of the country's four largest, ceasing to accept payments from sanctioned Russian financial institutions this year. In February, the Chinese commercial bank Shouzhou went a step further and ended operations with clients in Russia and Belarus altogether. Then there were reports in March further indicating that several Chinese banks had stopped accepting payments from Russia in the Chinese yuan as well. So for this latest bit of news, Alibaba's stance comes amid growing international pressure on companies to sever ties with Russia, because ultimately, if you're a multinational company that risks choosing Russia as your external customer base or every other country, then it's not a difficult choice to toe the line when it comes to economic sanctions. Although, to be fair, I have to also accept the reality that this could all be just one large smokescreen with various other legally separated subsidiaries of Alibaba and other Chinese companies for that matter, still potentially performing various business transactions with Russia in whatever currency Russia wants. But it all gets exposed sooner or later. Exposed, then still denied. But it is a risky endeavor nonetheless for Chinese companies to partake in such practices. Then to some more economy news, Russia plans to raise taxes on companies and wealthy individuals to fund the war in Ukraine, as the finance minister's proposal aims to generate 2.6 trillion rubles annually to cover the fiscal deficit from the invasion. So the tax height, set for next year, in real dollar values will raise about $29 billion yearly and affect around 2 million people within the country. Also, the corporate tax will rise from 20% to 25%, adding $18 billion in the fiscal year of 2025. So what we're looking at here is the raising of Russian taxes directly as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This will not be popular. Of course, the Russian oligarchy may get hit the hardest, which could backfire and cause some negative implications for Putin due to the wealthy elite of the nation taking their own measures to skim from the top elsewhere and all around remove their supportive stance for the top dog and his foreign policy blunders. Then headed across to a brief lighter segment of a type I haven't done in a while, so super quick one, as here's a short video of a Ukrainian soldier caring for a kitten inside his warm camo jacket. Ah, they have each other. Then headed across to a couple of funnies to round it all off today, guys. So starting off, behold, Russian autonomous ground vehicles in the field. But it's not what you might think, because on closer inspection, you find it is... Having this start-stop tug-like motion, only to find out that it's actually just a boat or a bathtub that has a, a rope that was stretched between two Russian positions, which quite exhaustingly gets pulled between both sides for exchanges of supplies between. And needless to say, we have this footage from AFU recon drone operators who destroyed this technological advancement by sending out a drone to meet it in the field. How demoralizing that would have been for the rope puller. <laughs> then headed across to maybe one or two lowbrow funnies, as there's recently been a few odd stories floating around inside Russian circles stating that if you are eliminated in the field as a Russian soldier or sustain massive injuries, you'll get resurrected or healed. Now, these stories are propagated out to Russians direct from the Kremlin because, well, at a certain point, Putin just decided to see how much he could lie to the public to get as many people to sign up for his war as he can. Or I should say, as much as he can. And at this point, even ISIS propaganda is more believable than Russian propaganda with the desperate lengths Russia will go to to fund its manpower effort in Ukraine. Then, to a related lowbrow funny to round things off as Russian finance minister turned defense minister Bela Usov has combined his mathematical background education with the Russian Eastern Orthodox Church. As apparently, Bela Usov prayed with Patriarch Kirill, with the outcome being a 5% decrease in losses for the Russian frontliners. So, in a world where Russia doesn't even admit to any losses in the field, somehow they're now saving themselves 5%. But why not 50%? Or better yet for Russia, why not attach a 200% figure for the enemy's losses instead? 
Just wow. All done as one of the first actions from this former Minister of Economic Development. It doesn't instill a lot of confidence. So that's it for today, guys. Thanks again for watching. Please continue to like and comment. I really do appreciate it and uh, the support too, as I always mention. And yeah, thanks again. And I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.